If you were trapped inside a building and forced to solve the deadliest puzzles in the world, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death traps in Escape Room. This teenage girl is going to outsmart everyone. Zoe here is a college student who has no idea what to do for the holidays. When her roommate brings her a package, it's a present from Zoe's professor, and when the girl opens it up, she finds a strange cube inside. Examining it closer, she discovers that it's a puzzle box, but she's not the only person to receive one. Across the city, other people have been given the exact same gift, and when they finally solve it, a card pops out. It's an invitation to an exclusive escape room hosted by the Minos Corporation, advertising that the first person to beat them will win $10,000, and none of them have any idea that they're about to risk their lives in six horrifying death traps tailor-made just for them. The next morning, Amanda here enters this building where the escape rooms are being hosted and finds a single security guard waiting inside. The man asks for her ID and her phone, explaining none of the players are allowed to post pictures of the rooms online. Something feels off, but the woman agrees and heads into the elevator where this kid Danny joins her, pulling out a second phone from his bag. The guy has come prepared, but it won't be enough to save his life. Upstairs, they walk into a room where they find three other players who have been invited to participate. They all sit down on the couch waiting for the game to start, when this kid Danny starts bragging that he's done tons of escape rooms before. Getting impatient, Ben here decides to leave the room for a smoke, but as soon as he pulls on the handle, it breaks off. The others are confused, but that's when Danny realizes this must be the escape room, and the game has already started. Okay, no one in this room is thinking straight, and they've ignored every sign that this is a death game waiting to happen. First of all, if you've been invited to play a game for $10,000, then you have to assume that what you're being asked to do is worth that much money in return. Now, it's possible that this is just an elaborate marketing campaign, but the problem is that the only person here with any escape room experience is this guy. Nobody else has any business being here, and that makes this whole situation sketchy as hell. Now, the biggest mistake these players made was that none of them did any research before walking into the building. Zoe here thought this box came from her teacher, but she never bothered to confirm whether or not this was true. Then, there's the name of the company, which is called the Minos Corporation, and that's a lot more suspicious than it sounds. In Greek mythology, King Minos was a tyrant ruler who created a labyrinth that was impossible to escape from, and trapped his evil minotaur son inside of it. Every year, he would then sacrifice seven boys and seven girls to keep the monster fed. A company that takes this story and turns it into their brand philosophy is a f***ing red flag, and that one detail should have made every single player think twice about entering the building. Now, it's too late for these people to realize any of this because they're already trapped inside and have to solve the puzzle, but the key to beating this is to identify the theme and then look for clues that match that theme. One of the most commonly made mistakes in escape rooms is to think that everything could be relevant, and the smarter approach is to filter the information to find what we're looking for. If I were in this situation, I would have used all this downtime to observe my surroundings, and it would have been easy to notice that there are symbols of fire everywhere in the room. The newspaper is about burn victims, the magazines are about barbecue cooking and smoke, and the first book on the shelf is Fahrenheit 451, which is a science fiction novel about burning books. There's even a photo hanging from the wall of a fire escape. Then there's the name Wooten because it's way too strange a name to ignore. Believe it or not, this is actually a real name that originates from the old English word Wudu, which means wood, and Tun, which means enclosure. Putting these together, the name is a clue that matches every other sign so far, because wood is used to fuel fire, and they're trapped in an enclosed escape room. With this in mind, we can assume anything relevant has to do with fire, and now we can narrow down our search for things like water, fire extinguishers, and ashtrays because they fit the theme. This kind of thinking can double our speed at finding clues and solve the escape room because we won't be wasting our time looking in places that are not relevant. Walking over to the door, Danny explains that the knob looks like an oven dial, and that must mean they need to find a combination to unlock it. The group begins searching for clues, and Mike here thinks he's found one. Inside of this book is a screwdriver, and as they try to figure out where to use it, Zoe realizes that the book he found is Fahrenheit 451. That's the next hint, and she turns the oven dial to that temperature, powering these metal coils of the ceiling. The group continues looking around, and this kid Ben rips a fire extinguisher off the wall, but quickly realizes that it's fake. 
frustrated, he tosses it on the floor when they all hear a strange noise and suddenly notice that the columns in the room are heating up too. Everyone here is going to be cooked alive if they don't escape, but Zoe examines the fire extinguisher and finds a key hidden inside. Finding the only lock in the room, she opens the sliding door to ask for help, but instead of a receptionist, they discover a dummy holding a ringing phone. Nervous, the businessman answers it, hearing a voice on the other end welcoming them to the game and encouraging the players to follow the posted rules. It doesn't make sense, but as soon as he puts the phone down on the receiver, metal sheets begin blocking the windows. Suddenly, these fans appear, blowing hot air into the room as everyone starts to panic, but Zoe here realizes they've just been given an important clue. Walking over to the wall, she finds a plaque instructing them to use the coasters and rushes to the coffee table. The girl presses down on one, and a painting across the room rises, revealing a secret exit. It's the only way out, and they'll need to press down on all six coasters to escape before they're burned alive. The businessman crawls through the ventilation shaft first, where he discovers a grate that's screwed shut. Acting quickly, the older man crawls through to hand the screwdriver over, but with more people leaving the room, there are less hands to hold down the coasters. They're going to be trapped here. But Zoe notices a water cooler in the corner and comes up with a clever plan. Filling a cup with water, she puts it down on a coaster, and the girls head for the ventilation shaft while the guys do their best to weigh down the other coasters with more cups. But that's when they discover a problem. There's not not enough water to keep the exit open, and a massive burner suddenly turns on above their heads. Time is running out, but Ben pulls out his flask and dumps his whiskey in one of the cups, filling it until the exit is fully opened. They manage to escape the puzzle at the last second and climb into the next room, narrowly avoiding getting roasted. Okay, these players are in over their heads. They managed to solve the puzzle, but if Ben didn't have a flask of whiskey on him, both of these kids would have been trapped and burned alive, and they only survived by pure luck. This is not a sustainable strategy, but there's a viable lesson to learn here that might help us in the next death trap. This one lucky break makes it clear that the game makers will let us use any object we want if it helps us solve the puzzle, and that's a huge advantage. Now, this would have been really useful earlier in the game because these players spent way too much time holding down the coasters, making it impossible for them to escape. It's a losing strategy, and it would have made much more sense if they focused on using the objects around them. The smartest approach is to find something heavy as quickly as possible, and surprisingly, water is not the answer. If it were me, I would have used the glasses and weighed each of them down with a book, because I wouldn't have to waste valuable time filling each glass to the top before it's heavy enough to use. This would have let them all escape quickly and at the same time, instead of putting Ben and Danny here as the last players inside without enough water. Now, even if the entire group didn't figure out how to weigh the coasters down, there was still a smarter way to get out, because all we would need to do is prop open the door to hack the game. From what we can observe, this ventilation shaft is about two and a half feet tall, or roughly 75 centimeters, and the strongest item here that matches that description is this metal trash can. If we were running out of time, I would have everyone push down the coasters and jam the exit open, holding it in place from inside the vent for everyone to climb through. The great thing is that it's narrow enough to leave space to pass without completely blocking the exit, and the metal is sturdy enough to take the mechanical force of the doorway without being crushed. The group catches their breath in this cabin, and Dan Danny here is shocked by how realistic this game is. Overwhelmed, the redhead asks the kid for his phone to call the cops, but when he hands it over, she discovers that there's no signal. Their only way out is to solve this puzzle, and it's about to get more dangerous. Meanwhile, the businessman inspects the door and finds a combination lock that requires a seven-letter word to open. Across the room, the old man finds an embroidery above the fireplace that says, you'll go down in history, and nobody understands the clue. But Ben here notices antlers hanging on the wall, with letters inscribed on each plaque. That's when he suddenly realizes the answer and tells the others the password must be Rudolph. As soon as the businessman enters it, the lock opens and they all start to leave the building. Heading outside, the group find themselves walking in a winter wonderland, but when they all step out, the door locks itself shut. There's no going back now, and to make matters worse, the temperature is rapidly dropping. The nerd steps forward to explore the escape room, but he bumps right into a perfectly disguised wall. The others laugh, but that's when they hear the frozen lake below them start to creak. It's a sign that it's breaking, and vents pop open, releasing a blast of freezing cold air. 
there. The group is terrified, and with no other choice, they look for clues to beat the room. Jason here manages to find a doorway, but it needs a small key to unlock. Meanwhile, the others find a single coat to share among them, and that's when they hear Ben yell out in pain. He stepped into a hole in the ice, and they figure that this must be where the next clue is. Luckily, the old man found a fishing pole, but as he approaches the group, the girl discovers something in the pocket of her coat. It's a compass, and she follows the pointer into the tree line where she sees a stuffed polar bear. Reaching deep inside its mouth, the girl pulls out a magnetic lure and quickly walks back to join the group. Zoe attaches the magnet to the pole, and as they drop the line to go fishing for the next clue, something gets hooked. It's extremely heavy, and the group discovers it's a block of ice with a key frozen in the very center. Coming up with a plan, the businessman asks the boy for his lighter, and he tosses it across the surface of the lake, but it doesn't reach them. Danny here decides to retrieve it and walks over to pick it up, but just as he turns around to head back to the others, the ice beneath him cracks. The kid is trapped underneath the lake, and the redhead is about to jump in to save him, but the businessman stops her. The group desperately searches for the kid, but they lose sight of him under the ice. There's nothing they can do as the boy suffocates, and now the survivors know for certain that this is a death game. That's one player down, with five more to go. With the lighter underneath the frozen lake, Jason tells them they have no choice but to use their body heat to melt the block of ice. They work together until it's finally small enough for one person to hold, and the businessman picks the key out of the block before taking it to the door. He manages to turn the lock, and that's when a section of the wall raises on the other side of the room. They finally found the exit, and the group runs over as the ice starts exploding beneath them. All of the remaining players have barely made it out alive, but the next game is going to be much harder to beat. Okay, this one gives me shivers. So far, this death game is trying to test our ability to think in extreme temperatures, and that's a lot harder to do than you might realize. When it's too cold, your body struggles to keep its internal temperature, and that means we use energy resources that would otherwise be needed for critical thinking. Now, having said that, there were still plenty of things this group could have done before it got this desperate, and the biggest mistake they're making right now is not learning any lessons from the first death trap. Earlier, when they tried to leave the room, they realized it was already too late, and I wouldn't let this happen again. If it were me, as soon as the cabin door opens, I would stick something in the door frame to keep it from closing on us. This would give us the benefit of being able to see what environment we are going to be challenged with, and take valuable items from the cabin to help us solve the puzzles. If you look here, you can see that on the walls that there's a rack full of leather straps, as well as an oil lantern that produces heat. Since we know that the game won't punish us for thinking outside the box, we should plan ahead and take as many items from this cabin as possible. Keeping the cabin door open helps us all stay warm during the game, which lets us maximize our energy to solve the puzzles instead. Now, since these guys didn't do any of that, we have to figure out how to beat this game without the cabin, and that means all we have to work with is a fishing pole, a jacket, a compass, and the environment. But this is still enough if we work together. The most important thing to realize is that the game is trying to force us into making decisions, but we can't assume that those decisions are going to be best for our survival. This jacket is the perfect example, because it makes them think that it's the only possible way to stay warm, which is a lie. The smarter thing to do here is to stay together in a huddle and use the warmth of each other's bodies to create our own microclimate of body temperature, providing more collective energy to the group than a single jacket. It might sound counterintuitive, but it's surprisingly effective, and even Emperor Penguins use this as a natural strategy to keep themselves warm during the coldest winters. Now this highlights a really important point. Losing a member of the group is bad for everyone this early in the game. If someone falls through the ice like this, the normal strategy is to be cold-blooded and let him die. But this is a cooperative death game. Danny has the most escape room experience, and that's a resource we need to protect. So we need to figure out how to save this guy quickly without risking anyone else's lives in the process. The cold shock will cause an involuntary response to breathing, and that means this kid won't be able to stop himself from inhaling water into his lungs. So we have only one minute to save his life. If it were me, I would immediately split up with one group taking these branches here and shoving them down into the water. The others need to rush ahead of the current and use the metal frame of this ice block to try breaking a hole in the lake before he reaches them. This is our best chance to save him, because both strategies can be executed quickly. If we look at where he ended up before dying, we can tell that the current took him approximately 7 meters away from where he fell, which means for every 10 seconds, Danny is traveling 1.60 meters under the ice. Now this branch is nearly 3 meters long, so if we can submerge it in less than 30 seconds, we would be able to reach him quickly enough for the kid 
Elliot to grab on and pull him to safety before he dies. In the next room, the lights suddenly turn on and they realize they're standing in an upside down bar, but they don't have long to catch their breaths. The room starts rising up like an elevator and when it finally comes to a stop, a phone begins ringing. It's attached to the pool table above them and falls out of the receiver, landing in the old guy's hand. Answering it, a dial tone screeches throughout the entire room and a song begins playing over the speakers. The next game has officially begun and their only way out is through this door, but they need to find the handle in order to escape. Searching the room, the old man notices that the eight ball is missing from the pool table and looks around for another clue, but the floor in front of him suddenly drops. He's pulled away just in time as the panel he was about to step on falls down a massive elevator shaft and they realize that the most dangerous part of this room is the floor. It's absolutely terrifying, and they quickly run to the edges to hold onto the railings as the group desperately tries to figure out what to do next. The redhead decides to take a risk and climbs onto the roof of the bar to look behind the counter. Investigating further, she discovers a lockbox and it needs a four-digit code to open. As the woman tries different combinations, Zoe here notices a collection of records on the wall and the girl realizes it's a sliding block puzzle. She carefully makes her way over to the platform and climbs up, doing her best to solve it quickly, but another floor section falls down the shaft. Jason here almost gets killed, but he manages to pull himself to safety at the last second while Zoe moves the sliding blocks into position, revealing a pattern of colors and shapes. These clues might represent the colors of the billiard balls, and using the numbers on them must be the passcode. Amanda tries to enter the combination into the lockbox, but it doesn't work. That's when another section of the floor drops down the shaft and the players hold onto the wall for dear life, but the combined weight of three players is too heavy and it breaks off. If they don't let go, they're all going to die. So Zoe tries to climb onto the roof of the bar, but loses her grip, crashing to the floor. Coming back to her senses, she remembers that the room is upside down and tells the redhead that the code to the lockbox must also be reversed. This time, Amanda is able to open it and finds the doorknob inside. It's exactly what they need in order to escape, but there's a problem. Another section of the floor has dropped into the shaft below, leaving only one left. Now she's stranded on the other side of the room. Amanda here will have to climb across to make it out alive, but with no better options, she jumps onto the pool table, using it to cross the chasm. The woman is so close to the other side, but that's when the doorknob falls out of her pocket. She immediately drops down, catching it before it tumbles into the shaft and throws the eight ball at the others to open the door, but they're running out of time. The last section of floor drops from beneath her, and the woman holds onto the phone for dear life. It's going to snap, and the others try to save her, holding out a pull cue to pull Amanda to safety, but she loses her grip and falls to her death. That's two players down and four more to go. Okay, this is the one room where being cold-blooded is the most logical approach for survival. These guys did a pretty good job of solving the puzzle, but they were not thinking about the most efficient way to beat it. First of all, they all knew they would have to search the room for clues, but being on the ceiling here gives them access to nothing. Nobody has any reason to be standing there, so the smartest approach from the very beginning is to have everyone climb up into the room. Now, as soon as they understood the danger, they should have adjusted their strategy. This is the first game so far where physical fitness is a requirement and weakness is a total liability. For example, if we were relying on the fat old guy here to climb across the entire room like a monkey, we would all be doomed. With this in mind, we have no choice but to be cold-blooded and force the fittest players to solve the puzzles on our behalf. In a cooperative death game like this, relying on weak players for our survival is a risk no one should be willing to take. I would convince Jason and Amanda here to work together and climb across the room while the rest of us stay here on this ledge next to the door. In the meantime, we can try to solve the puzzle from a place of safety and tell them what to do. It might sound cold-blooded and lazy, but it's honestly the most logical approach to this specific room. And the sooner we realize this, the faster we can get out of here. Now, Amanda here did a great job cracking the safe and finding the doorknob, but she made two of the most idiotic mistakes in the entire game. If this 8-ball is the key to your survival, there's no way on earth you would let it stick out of your pants like this. This woman needs to shove that all the way down into her pocket because she's literally hanging over a 50 meter drop and it's way too easy to fall out. The second mistake she made was swinging across this pool table here. Instead of jumping to climb above the table, she stretched out her arms to hang from it, which is an unnecessary risk. Shimmying across the entire room is going to be a lot more work and it forces her to use some of the most underdeveloped muscles in the human body. Any one of us would have jumped from this bar stool because it's higher, allowing us to get more of our bodies over the table to pull ourselves up with stronger muscles and less effort. 
Opening the door, the players leave the bar for the next escape room and find themselves in a creepy hospital. Looking around, the group searches for clues, but something isn't right. They each find hospital beds with their own medical records, and the players realize the Minos Corporation specifically made these games just for them. It becomes clear to everyone that they're all the lone survivors of a near-death experience, and now they're being tested to see which of them will make it out of here alive. That's when a TV turns on, telling the players that this time, they'll have to put their hearts to the test, and will only have 5 minutes to solve the puzzle, or else they'll be killed with a poisonous gas. But Zoe has had enough. She thinks they need to break the rules somehow to survive this, but Ben here points out it's impossible. The people running this game are always watching on the cameras, but the girl realizes she might be able to hack the game and break out of here. Searching the room, the older man finds an x-ray of a hand and brings it over to a light box as the others place two more x-rays next to it. The boy quickly figures out that the clue spells EKG in sign language and they'll need to find one in order to beat this room. But that's when they hear something shatter behind them. Zoe is breaking every camera she can find, knowing that if the game designers can't see anyone, then they might be able to cheat. But with only four minutes on the clock, every second counts. Finding an EKG machine Machine. This guy reminds them the TV said they need to put their hearts to the test, so measuring a high enough heart rate might help them find the exit. Testing his theory, he attaches electrodes to Ben's chest, but it's too low. Someone else has to do it, and the older man goes next, but it's still not high enough. The guy figures there's only one way to raise it high enough and pulls out the shock paddles. The idea is completely insane, but with time running out, Mike decides to risk it and agrees to get electrocuted. His pulse skyrockets gets to over 200 beats per minute, but it doesn't work, and he dies on the gurney, making that three players down with three more to go. It's terrifying, but there's barely any time left on the clock, and the businessman finally realizes he has to lower his heart rate to escape. Suddenly, poisonous gas starts pumping into the room, and the guy starts to meditate until his heart rate drops to 50 beats per minute, but this time, the plan works. The light box behind them swings open and reveals the door to their escape. The men quickly head inside the exit and leave Zoe behind in the room as she chokes to death. That's four players down, with two more to go. Okay. There was a much better way to solve this puzzle. The group figured out that they needed to find an EKG, but they should have realized that the best way to get the right heart rate is from the most physically healthy person in the room. Everyone can get their heart rate higher, but someone out of shape will have a hard time lowering it, especially when they're stressed about dying. We already know that the puzzles were tailor-made for each player, and it just so happens that this guy caught hypothermia while stranded in a boating accident, which slows your heartbeat. So that's exactly why I would hook him up to the EKG first. Now, there's another problem the group has to deal with, and that's the poisonous gas being pumped into the room. They're never told what it is, but it's reasonable to assume that it might be carbon monoxide since Danny's family died from inhaling that specific gas. As it's released, it spreads quickly through the air because it has a lighter atomic weight than oxygen, and it only takes 5 minutes of continued carbon monoxide inhalation to be poisoned. We need to act fast to stay alive, so if it were me, I would take the blankets from the beds here and wrap them around the gas pipe to block the poison for as long as possible. This becomes even more effective if we dampen the cloth first using either the liquid inside the IV bags or this faucet over here, because liquid-infused surfaces can actually capture carbon monoxide molecules. The more layers the wet cloth we have over the gas nozzles, the better we can slow the poison from spreading throughout the room. Then, we can tighten the valves on the canisters to make it harder for the gas to spread and break these window panes so that there's more oxygen circulating in the room. By putting these strategies together, we have a very good chance to make the gas trap less effective and it gives us the time we need to solve the puzzle without putting our lives in danger. Making it into the next room, Ben here is ridden with guilt and scolds the other survivor for killing their friend, but the businessman brushes him off. The only thing he cares about is making it out of here and begins to look around for clues. Without wasting any time, he finds a hatch in the floor and even though Ben knows this might be a trap, the kid agrees to try. Turning the door handle, he realizes he's not strong enough, so the men work together and manage to pull the hatch open, but this was their biggest mistake. They've both just exposed themselves to a deadly poison that makes them hallucinate, and finding a message written on the other side of the door, they realize that the only way to survive is to find the antidote somewhere 
somewhere in this room. They're struggling to keep it together. But that's when Ben realizes that the TV set might be showing him a clue. It's playing a live recording from a camera behind them, and he gets up to start searching for it. Tripping balls, he manages to find a secret drawer with a syringe inside. It's the cure they've been looking for, but there's only enough for a single person. Suddenly, the businessman tackles him to the floor, and the men wrestle for the antidote, but the kid manages to push the guy back. Fighting through the poison, Ben takes the syringe for himself and administers the cure, saving his own life as the man dies from the deadly toxin. That's five players down with one more to go. The kid is the only survivor left in the game, and he looks down into the hatch to see a study beneath him, but it breaks apart, dropping him into the final death trap. Meanwhile, in the hospital room, two staff members wearing hazmat uniforms walk in to clean up the bodies and notice something strange. There's an oxygen mask connected to the ceiling, and that's when they're suddenly attacked by Zoe from behind. She was using the mask to breathe without being caught by cameras, tricking the game makers to think that she was dead. The girl picks up a drop gun off the floor and walks through the secret doorway, ready to confront the people behind this twisted death game. Okay, Zoe's plan was pretty smart, and she's definitely the MVP of the group. Somehow she used the mask to breathe clean air from above the ceiling, and now that she's taken out two staff members, the girl is ready to f*** this death game right up. Zoe is heading into what looks like a secret corridor that is only accessible by the staff, and considering how elaborate these escape rooms are, it's possible that this place was modeled after the Disney World Utilidor. These tunnels stretch across a whole nine acres of land underneath the theme park so that workers and cast members can secretly travel across the grounds. Now, this building is smaller than a theme park, but any cleanup crews would need to access the escape rooms at all times, so Zoe has a chance to find her friend to save him before it's too late. Ben, on the other hand, is surviving based on pure luck, because when he walked back towards the wall, he randomly banged on it until something happened. As always, the smartest approach here is to not touch anything until you have a better understanding of what the theme of the room is and take a catalog of the items inside. If they did this instead of fighting, they would have realized there's almost nothing in here, but that's really really useful information. If you've already searched the place sober, then when you're hallucinating, you're not gonna check those places again, and it lets you focus on other parts of the room. Now the key to beating this trap is to understand that you can't trust what you see. This is an extremely important point, because it means that finding the antidote will not be done by sight, it will need to be done by something more reliable, and right now that's by touch. Once the hallucinogen is in our system, the smartest approach is to feel your way across the room and trust your tactile senses, because you might be able to discover something that our other senses aren't telling us. It's no accident that this room is visually stimulating, but actually quite empty, and that's a good indication that if we filter out this information, we'll have a better chance at getting out alive. Getting up off the floor, Ben finds himself inside of a study and wastes no time trying to find his way out. Approaching a door on the other side of the room, he sees a maze with numbered levers on it and realizes that he needs a four-digit code to open it. Without thinking, the kid pulls down on one of the levers, but that was his biggest mistake. The wall behind suddenly starts moving towards him and the death trap has just activated. Ben searches for clues and finds a map telling him to look for something that's green. Seeing a green book, he climbs a ladder and picks it up, but gets knocked to the floor. The room is closing in on him, and he's going to be crushed to death if he doesn't get out of here soon. Opening the book, he discovers the next clue, saying to watch another die unveils time's great mystery. Acting quickly, he spots a series of photos showing different people pointing, and realizes it represents the hands on a clock. It must be the passcode, and he rushes to the door, moving the levers in position, but it doesn't Unlock. His theory was wrong, and Ben is trapped here with no way out, but he quickly comes up with a clever idea. Finding a shield, he protects himself from the flames of the fireplace and squeezes himself inside for safety. Okay, Ben here is not thinking clearly. We've already learned from previous rooms that touching things will activate the death trap, so pulling on this lever was a horrible decision. Now, this puzzle might look easy, but if he spent more time taking in his surroundings, he would have realized that the game makers are setting him up to fail. If we step back and observe the place, you'll notice there are Latin phrases painted on the walls, and they all have a very specific meaning. The one above the door were the last words spoken by Emperor Augustus of Rome, and it means the play is over. The phrase behind him means death death always wins, and this over here means death is my reward. There's also a stuffed weasel on the mantelpiece, taxidermied butterflies, and a pair of death masks mounted on the wall. Clearly, everything in this room is about death, including Latin, which is a dead language. All four pictures on the wall are images of people watching someone die, and when you combine these details together, it seems to be saying that this room is specific.
specifically designed to watch the last player get killed with no way out. Coincidentally, no way out is also an anagram for Wu Tan Yu, whose name keeps appearing throughout the escape rooms. Now, despite all of this horrifying information, he could have saved himself a lot of time because there was an easier way to figure out that he was screwed. If you look closely at this maze, you'll see that most of these numbers don't even connect to the center. Number nine here barely goes anywhere, and that means this puzzle can be brute forced because there are only four numbers that can be placed there. If he studied the maze for long enough, he would have realized this was a dead end and had more time to clear the fireplace, which is obviously obviously the only safe zone in the room. That's when the walls suddenly retract, giving him the space he needs to escape. The game is finally over, and the kid wastes no time rushing out of the room into a rundown section of the building, but it's filled with boxes of stage equipment. This is the surveillance room the game makers were using to watch them, and that's when a mysterious man steps out of the shadows. He reveals himself to be the game's master, explaining that the Minos Corporation created these escape rooms to entertain their wealthy clients. Every year, they pick a new type of victim to gamble on until there's only one winner. It's sickening. And Ben here asks the man if he can go home since he's the only survivor. But the game's master has some bad news. Wrapping a cord around his neck, the guy starts strangling him, but that's when the cameras are subtly hacked. The man realizes that someone's been added back to the roster and sees a hit list with his photo as well as Zoe's. Suddenly, the girl shoots him from behind as he runs for his life. She falls after the man ready to finish him off, but by the time she turns the corner, he's nowhere in sight. She walks back to check on her friend, but that's when the game's master Master tackles her and grabs the gun, pointing it straight at her head. There's no way for her to escape, but the girl is not alone. That's when Ben suddenly knocks the man off of Zoe, saving her life, before picking up the gun and viciously shooting the man dead. The game is finally over, and the survivors leave the building to get her friend to the hospital. Six months later, Zoe and Ben meet up to talk, and the girl has something to show him. Opening a folder, she reveals that all the players who died in the game had their deaths covered up, and she has a plan to expose the Minos Corporation for their crimes. She tells them that the company's logo has coordinates that lead to a building in New York, and they can finally put a stop to these escape rooms. Ben agrees to go with her and investigate, with no idea they're walking straight into another trap. But what do you think? How would you beat Escape Room? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.